Hello and welcome everybody. I'm your host, JR Honeycutt. This is another episode of Back It, and I'm back after a while off. And who better to talk to on Back It than one of my very favorite guests of all time, Lone Shark Games' Mike Salinger. What's up, Mike? Uh, I see a live button. That means we're doing it live. We're doing it live. And yeah, no. if people are watching right now, they can actually talk to us on YouTube. New feature on uh, YouTube Live is that we can moderate chat there. So if you have questions, you want me to ask Mike, put it up there. And if I can get him in, I'll do it. Cool. Oh. Cool. 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 How well, are me, you, man? How are things? I, I'm good. Uh, it is a standard uh, Seattle day out, uh, incredibly overcast, dark, gloomy. No, it's gorgeous, actually. And uh, and uh, just a, a really good, really good time right now. We've got great things going on in the games we're making, good stuff on Kickstarter, happy, happy go lucky lifestyle. It's good. It's exciting, man. I love that time period in between like when projects have launched and like before anything catastrophic happens where everything just feels like it's a success is the best. Yeah. I Uh, mean, we we always have so much emotion at at any given moment that, um, that, uh, you know, there's always something on all parts of that spectrum, I guess. But, uh, but yeah, this month, this, this coming month is going to be really, really cool for us. Um, yeah, I'm actually I'm gonna ask you about the betrayal expansion. I was gonna yeah. surprise you with that and hope that I could get some extra like exclusive information out of you if you were like, oh wait, what? Answered honestly, are we live? Who knows? Yeah, can't, can't fix this in post. That's right. But the, the jig is up. The jig is up now, Mike, and you're prepared. So I don't know what to do with myself. Um, Darn. We are we are at least ostensibly are supposed to talk about Thornwash currently That's on Kickstarter. You've got three thousand eight hundred seventy three backers. You've raised four hundred eighty one thousand three hundred sixty nine dollars, and you have about six days left to go. So first, congrats on exceeding your goal by what looks like about times five. Nice work, almost times six now. Um, no, yeah, sorry. Doing math in my head, bad, bad plan on camera. Right. Sli- <laughs> slightly more than times six. Yeah. <laughs> That's good TV, right? Yep. <laughs> Watching a game designer calculate. I can't imagine anyone would expect any less of us than to be like, well, it's like 6.1 something, right? That sounds right. That's exactly what I was doing. I think, I think James Ernest would have actually just been like, JR, your math is wrong. And then like, beep, boop, boop, it's this. And also, if you want to bet on the Falcons. Yeah. Actually, James would have not bothered to do the math. He would have just told you your math was wrong just to <laughs> see you say, sorry, man. <laughs> right? Like, he doesn't even, doesn't even need to do it. I mean, I'm not wrong. It is more than times five funded. I'm just, that's true. Yeah. So no, it's very true. That's right. Um, all right, cool, man. So this thing is, it's going bonkers, man. It's like mm-hmm. it's gangbusters. You're killing it. And this has been the talk of the town, the Kickstarter town, uh, since you launched that. this thing at, yeah. PAX, at PAX West, PAX Prime, PAX Seattle, yes. whatever we call it. All of, those, all of those things. At all three of those conventions, we launched it. Exactly. So uh, first off, tell me, what is Thornwatch? And then I have a gajillion questions for you. Sure. Uh, Thornwatch is a collaboration between my team at Lone Shark Games and the team at Penny Arcade. They make uh, comic strips and stuff like that. And uh, they uh, they have created this series of conventions called PAX, which people go to all over the world. You and I have been at multiple PAXs together. Uh, and uh, uh, they came up with an idea. Well, they came up with two ideas sort of independently. They came up with a really cool environment called the Irewood, which is a magical forest, which with monsters and, and strange things happening. And it's protected by some uh, fantasy boy scouts called the lookouts and some uh, druidesses called the daughters and uh, a group of mystical spirits called the thorn watch. And it's a really brilliant set of comic strips. I, I encourage people to go online and check them out. Uh, look for great place to start is the words, the tithe. Um, it's just amazing. Um, so I really loved it. And I realized that they were making an epic as I, I saw it, you know, in little chunks, I guess. Um, and at the same time, Mike Krahulik was playing around Mike, who is uh, Gabe of Penny Arcade was playing around with an idea he had for a, a, an RPG with board game characteristics, uh, which he called Card Warriors with a Z, so you know it's good. Uh, All right, and, the Z tells you. Yeah, and uh, and somehow they put these two ideas together, and right about that time, our company moved into the Lone Shark building or into the Penny Arcade building. 
And so right at around the same time that they were thinking about this, we were like, we, I got to see it. And I said, this is really cool. I want to see this come out. I didn't think we were going to do it with them. I just thought uh, I wanted them to do it. So uh, what it is, it's a, it's a board game with some RPG elements. It's got a, a, a whole lot of beautiful maps and art. Uh, the, it's going to be the most beautiful game, one of the most beautiful games we've ever made. But uh, it feels like you're t we call it a graphic novel adventure because you're playing a game inside what appear to be comic strip panels and telling a story in a choose-your-own-adventure choose style. And so it really feels like you're in the middle of a comic. It really feels like you're in the middle of... And, and it's a very different kind of game for a lot of folks. It's like a lot of the things we do. It straddles that weird space between board games and RPGs, right, okay. or character-focused games, which is fine. Our stuff doesn't naturally fit genres perfectly. Okay. But... As far as I can tell, nearly every game that I've put out, I've invented the name of the genre that it is in. <laughs> I mean, genres only exist to describe what already like exists in a large enough quantity yeah. to mean something, right? So just yeah. Things. So I'm never, I mean, I do some some ordinary things, right? But but like the Pathfinder Adventure card game is an adventure card game, which was a term right. we didn't have, right? So, right. Um, but uh, yeah, it's really fun. Uh, it's a great game. It's it's very much like if you're looking for something with a very if you've never played an RPG, but you want something that has a little bit of that feel, but none of the burden and overhead and, and such, you can just pull it off the shelf. It's very much a open the box and play game as opposed to a prepar prepare forever game. Sure. Uh, and if you're just a board gamer, then it's a great tactical, I guess, battle and, and, uh, and objective sim in some ways. So right. I want to jump in on that. Would you say that the experience is mostly tactical or mostly storytelling, or can you get from it what you want of those two things and like sort of ignore the other as a group might play D and D or something? Yeah, um, it is both of those things. But in theory, you could ignore the role playing element, and you cannot ignore the tactical element. Because there are some rules as to how you progress. You yeah, there's no, you're moving around on a map. There's things that the judge has. There's a judge, and they have goals, and um, it'd be sure. impossible to ignore those goals. I mean, I, I don't know about impossible. I shouldn't say things like impossible. It's, it's very much hardwired into the rules that we tell you there's a combat and objective achieving engine, and, and that's most of the rules. Cool. And do you find that the experience, though, is the storytelling and the moments that come from it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it, <laughs> I said a thing the other day, and I kind of regretted saying it, but now that I've said it, it's kind of out there, which is a lot of the role-playing, all the role-playing elements are hardwired into the game. There's um, prompts for, for role-playing and getting bonus dice for it, and, and there's, there's co cosplay is hardwired in. Um, people wear knots that they achieve and get value out of those in the game and stuff like that. And so uh, I said, uh, probably not fairly, uh, we're going to try to bribe you to role play. <laughs> <laughs> sure. right? Like we're going to take those elements that we think make a really nice session and give you reasons to do them. And if you don't do them, that's cool. You can still get a great gameplay experience. But if you do them, you actually get, the judge actually has rationale to give you benefits toward what you're doing and make the best story possible. So, um, yeah. so yeah, uh, I don't know if that's, like I said, that's a very mercenary way to approach it. Obviously a lot of people just go in with a very free attitude toward this game. Very nice. Uh, we're just going to play and see what happens and it works out great. That's, yeah, it's okay. It's interesting because um, Kickstarter has a reputation for being different depending on what kind of product you're creating, the way that you approach the marketing, the way that you approach communication with your backers. Um, in the pre-show, we talked about graphic novels, which are a very different product in Kickstarter, versus board games. But I imagine that like RPGs also exist differently in that you're trying to demonstrate the art and talk about the characters involved and the kinds of things that you might be doing and the stories you might tell. Whereas for a board game, people are like, dog, give me 400 miniatures and I will click back. And that's kind of all they care about. Yeah, like how been, do you been, deal with the intersection of all those things? It's it's fascinating to me. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, it's I talk about this stuff all the time. Um, well, 
there's a special class of games which are the 400 miniature games, and those achieve at a uh, at an outcome irrespective of their gameplay and. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't. I don't mean to denigrate them because some of them are great, right? Sure, but they, they sound like toys, right? Yeah, but the toy value is huge, and so sometimes people just back them because I want those toys and I want to use them for something else, or I just want them on my wall or whatever, right? So, right. Um, and that's totally cool. So, um, I've never run one of those campaigns, and I think I probably am not going to because I don't really want to be in the business of making miniatures. But um, so, pulling all those aside. Uh, the, um, the there's there's been not a lot. If, if you were to consider this an RPG campaign, which it kind of looks like in some ways, uh, we would we would be we would be doing extremely well on that on that spectrum because we we seem to be connecting very well with our audience that likes that kind of thing. Um, they are writing songs. They are are doing art. They are um, posting uh, videos. They're they're doing all of that, and it's uh, it's felt a lot like an RPG campaign in that way, right? The involvement, the enthusiasm has been very high in that regard. Um, if you look at it as a board game campaign, um, I think we're still doing very well, but. Uh, we haven't had the same kind of connection in a lot of ways with the um, what what you expect out of a board game audience. Like there haven't been a thousand reviews posted on Board Game Geek, for example. Um, right. Now we topped the hotness on Board Game Geek, which was great, right? Um, but it was primarily due to our our the chatter around the game, not necessarily about the board games geek specific activity around the game. Like, sure. Right. And so, um, so yeah, it's, it's been a very interesting hybrid. I mean, at the same time, you know, you want to show pretty pictures of the game pieces in action and, and stuff like that. And you want to show gameplay videos. I haven't felt as strong a desire to, um, to focus on um, the, you know, we, we've, we've expanded the, the pieces quite a bit because we, for example, offered a free expansion for anybody who kicks in an extra $5 in postage essentially to us. Um, so we're expanding the game content in that regard, but we've been expanding it predominantly through story and character, right? Um, physical manifestations of those things, right? And not in like, let me make sure that you get a whole lot of new, uh, um, you know, upgrades to your, your, the dice quality and, and, and things like that that you kind of use in a board game campaign. Sure. Right? Yeah, it's interesting to see the stretch goal list because so much of what you're creating is art-based or card-based. Yeah. Like, you can always say let and finish so many times and knowing you guys are going to be the best card quality to start with. There's no reason to talk about that. I'll be honest, that's a, that's a significant thing for us, right, is that there are some campaigns who can say, well, we'll do the cheap thing, Right. But if you give us money, we'll do the expensive thing. And everybody knows who we are and what we make, right? Yeah. We're com in some sense, we're competing with our own games. Right? Oh, if I got this game and it didn't have the same component quality that Pathfinder or Apocrypha did, then I would be like, this is yeah. weird. Yeah, why would, why would Lone Shark benefit from undercutting itself? Right, right. exactly. Right. Yeah. Or, or our clients in, in that regard, right? Like, we certainly don't want people who go out and buy the Betrayal expansion to come to one of our games and go, well, this isn't anywhere near as good looking as the Betrayal expansion. <laughs> you know, that's... Guys, you just printed it on index cards. What is this? Yeah. So, so we don't really have the tool set there to, to be able to say, well, trust us, we're, you know, like, yeah, if we made everything out of wood, uh, it would be a very expensive game for us to make. That's but, right. but we're not going to... Well, we are making some things out of wood here. Yeah. We're not gonna, but we're not gonna do like, yeah, we're not, we're not gonna go bankrupt in the process. But the, um, but yeah, we we start out with a very high level of quality expectation, both in our componentry and in our rules and replayability content. Sure. Uh, that's a huge thing for our games. I mean, Betrayal and and Pathfinder and Apocrypha and Ninth World are all like, trust me, you can play this a thousand times and it'll be different every time. 
God, I'm so excited for Ninth World. I've been waiting for that game for like two years. I'm so stoked for that. Only two years? Uh, actually, it'll be three. It'll be three in November yeah. since the first That's time. That's the thing with our games too, right? Is they take a while to incubate. Yeah. And so people are like, like, come on, come on. No, I'd rather have quality, man. I want to like, after what, four years of Kickstarter now, like don't, don't under deliver, just make the best thing and give it. I don't care if it comes in 2019, give me the thing, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I, mean, I, I understand that there's still value. Obviously there's still quite a bit of value to being a company that can deliver on its promises. Right. Um, I, I, if I have to cut something, I'm going to cut on the time scale. Right. But, um, you know, certain things that we've we've put out have come out on time, and certain that haven't. And we're gonna we're gonna keep trying to make like this one. We actually have a really strong reason to come out on time. We have a convention schedule that we really want to make. You think Thornwatch might sell okay at PAX? That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, we would like very much to have people playing the game live when we said the game was going to ship. Yeah, for sure. So. so Question for you. Um, you are obviously using a ton of content from Gabe and Tycho, the guys at Penny Arcade. Is this a publisher licenses content from a designer kind of thing, or are you guys co-creators? How does all this work together? Uh, it is some of both. Sure. It, so so um, Jerry and Mike are creating the Ironwood, and it's not our goal to own any of the Ironwood. Okay. It's not. That's that's just bad. Yeah, I mean, people who create should own what they create, and so and that's cool. Um, but we are creating a game line together that we are we are heavily invested in. As as are they. Awesome. Okay. Have um, you found in doing the Kickstarter that there's been significant? Because these guys are also massive content creators. Has there been like significant working together and like significant oh, yeah. synergies that have come from it? Oh oh yeah. Uh, I've had many, I mean, as you know, I, m most of my stuff is collaborative. Um, sure. Sometimes ridiculously collaborative, where you'll see like <laughs> different contributors to a, a game that I work on. Um, but this is probably the closest bond I've ever had with a uh, creative core because most of my games, um, this is not to take away from any of these games, okay? But, it, but, uh, most of my games, the game design gets done. You know, you write up a bunch of story stuff, and you then give it to a graphic designer or a, a you know the artists and say, "Please make what I just told you to make." Right, and you're already committed to it. Working directly with Mike and Jerry on something that isn't done uh, has been fantastic. I mean, we've been able to say the Ironwood would benefit from this. Can you make this? And those things happen, right? And so, okay. and they've been both on the visual and story front, real problem solvers for us. I'll come in and I'll say, I, I don't know how this should work. I'm, and I'll come in with an information presentation question, right? Like, how do we make the judge understand what we're trying to tell them? And then Mike will come back with uh, well, Rodney Thompson, who's... Um, also on the team, he's the developer of Lords of Waterdeep and uh, Fifth Edition Dungeons and Dragons and such. And, okay. and my guy Chad um, will propose some solution in their head that they don't know how to make work. They just go, this is what I expect the output of this to be. And then Mike will go off and say, I didn't really understand that, so I drew it. And he will come back with this gorgeous layout of whatever it is he drew. And we will go, yes, that's exactly what we were trying to say. We just couldn't articulate it. Or, or even envision it, right? And okay. so the, the content collaboration on this is, is amazing. Uh, and we're all um, fairly, uh, we're, we're big fans of each other, but that also leads to sort of a level of, of competition in some ways. Um, sure. So uh, on, uh, we're, we're always like saying, well, if that they did, they did that. I got to get my game up to be as good as what they created, right? There are times when we do something throwaway, and I'll go, no, 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 this is now a thing. We're doing this right all the way. I'll give you an example of that. We, um, I decided that I wanted to put some puzzles in the Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, I, was, I have a note to ask you about that. Okay, well, what's your question about it? 
Well, my question was, can I get a clue for the riddle of spring yes. and fall? But <laughs> fair, fair, fair enough. <laughs> yes. Right. Anyway, um, so uh, the um, but not on the not on the air. Fair enough. Fair enough. Because that would that would like then people will turn off the the show, right? To avoid getting a spoiler they don't want. That's right. No spoilers here, folks. No spoilers yeah. here. So, um, so I did. I was like, okay, I'm gonna think of some sort of puzzle thing. So at 9 p.m. one night. I started writing a puzzle hunt and I finished at 3 a.m. I, I, you know, I just kicked it out and I went in the next day and I said, I wrote this and they looked at it and they went, Holy God, what is this? How did, when did you do this? I said, last night they went, this is amazing. And then, so, and their response to it wasn't just to go, okay, dude, dude, I get, that's fantastic. Do it, put it on. They, they went back and Jerry wrote uh, a new concept for the world called crests, which are these, um, you know, uh, uh, roses that the mounted roses that the Thornwatch wear, and all the lore behind those. And it was just mind blowing. And then yeah. Krahulik saw that and went, "Holy cow! I mean, these guys are like achieving something amazing here." And he drew all the crests. And like I told him, like. You know, it'd be nice to once Jerry did that. So, when I said the crest, why don't you take the rose that's the the main uh, logo here and just do a color swap? And Mike went, sure, sure, no problem. And he came back. He did not do a color swap. <laughs> <laughs> there's like there's like pan pipes behind one of them, and one of the roses appears to be melting from its corruption. And you know, and just like wow. And, and and so this sort of like and then I, I got all that back and I went, well, these puzzles are gonna get a whole lot better now. Right? So there's a yeah. self reinforcing loop of we just have to do as we, we have to achieve at the same level. And and the end result I think is is really good. I've got to admit that if I was on the fence as to playing this, which I'm not, I'd love to play it, but like if I were in the fence as to doing this, the concept that I could solve riddles and that is meaningful. And that also, this is a world where characters in this world have previously like experienced things for which they earn crests, yep. for which they can only really talk to other people that have also earned that crest. It's yep. kind of like, hey, have you finished Pandemic Legacy? I have, do you, do you yep. wanna talk about it? Yeah. Right? Like the fact that you've created that in a world is such an exciting thing, because that's like such a thing that actually like, that is actually a manifestation of what the, the fandom hobby is like, right? Have you seen this movie? I've seen it, let's talk about it, right? Yeah, oh, I, I'm Thanks. sure somebody was like, I'm going to be so sad when this campaign ends and there's no more riddles. I said, what do you think? Why do you <laughs> think the riddles are going to end? Yeah, there are never no more riddles. Yeah, like, like what about me being on a project suggests that will occur? So, of right. course, there w that will be an element in the game, right? Of course, riddles are going to be, and, and we're going to encourage people to come up with their own and, and such. So, yeah, I mean, I think more than most games I work on, I think this has that effect. So uh, if, if you look at the Pathfinder game, obviously people create a million things for, um, for the Pathfinder RPG, right? Like they right. costumes and, and whatever, right? Because they, they feel a part of that world. What they create for the Pathfinder adventure card game is cards. Okay. That's it. Right. I mean, yeah. they don't go out of their way. Sometimes they make like tools to use their stuff better, like, you know, whatever. Yeah. But, but fundamentally, they make, they make gameplay objects. I was actually on Drive Through Cards yesterday, yeah. and I noticed that there's a link on the front page to like make your own. Yeah. yeah. But that's, I mean, it's great and it's wonderfully creative, but it's very much, I'm going to make a, a use, useful gameplay object to be a yeah, part of Yeah, it isn't necessarily like like an expression of fandom, right? Yeah. This is, I was like, no, we're going to go all out. We're going to get reasons for people to come to PAX in specific outfits. Right. We want people to, um, to write poetry and put it online and we will reward that. You want them to wear the crests they've earned on their outfit, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Our cosplay, um, people at PAX West, uh, who are in our booth, um, had, had a, crest on them and people were like i want that and i'm like yeah well there's only one of those now right <laughs> yeah and then in the in the booth another major expression of it was the birch trees that we had we had these um 
I think six or seven birch trees that we'd brought in. And uh, the story element that's about birch trees is that the way you summon these thorn watch, these ghostly spirits, is by tying a bramble knot in a tree. And the type of knot that you type dictates who will reply. Oh. So, like, if it's a hostage situation, then you'll, you'll tie the brother's knot. And then a particularly appropriate group of Thornwatch will show up to, to rescue the, the lookout that's been captured or whatever, right? Um, so it's, it's cool. So I was like, no, this has to be a thing. This isn't just a throwaway element in the game. So yeah. at the convention, um, everybody who demoed the game uh, got the ability to tie a knot in the tree to start their game. And... This was immensely powerful. Hundreds of people did it. Yeah. Uh, and then when they finished their demo, if they were successful, they got the knot of wings and we tied it directly onto their arm. Oh. And so people were going around the convention like they never took them off. Like if you yeah. demo you demoed on uh, we we made the cords out of leather because if you demoed on Friday, you sure didn't take it off till Monday. Wow. Or yeah. even, you know, then yeah, well, I hope at some point, you know, <laughs> at some point it came off. But, you know, um, somewhere, some intrepid adventurer not only has that knot on their wrist right now, they're waiting until their first game of their delivered Kickstarter copy. Right. Um, yeah, uh, leather is an animal product and uh, produces its own oils. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm going to suggest you take that off. Anyway, so... Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, it was a visceral reaction. People were totally into that aspect of it. And it, it, it is about that the game is fun, right? I mean, you, you don't want a thing like that for a game that isn't. But, right. But, but, yeah, if people can really enjoy themselves in their expression of the game, it's going to be really good for us. That's fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm super stoked for it. I'm really excited to try this out now. I wish that I'd had a chance to try it at PAX East or at Gen Con. Either one of those would have been great, and I did not. So now... I lament my choices. Um, you made poor life choices, but we will um, we will see each other at another convention, and you will play this game with me. That's true. Uh, I would actually so like Pax Pax South is maybe the one. I don't know. We'll figure it out. It'll be is there, are you near Texas? I am literally in Texas right literally now. Literally in the Texas. Currently, I mean, I am wearing a shirt that is for T. <laughs> yes, T- that's T- what I was referring to. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so uh, yeah, Pax South seems like uh, we are going to bring a lot of Thornwatch to Pax South. Excellent. Um, cool. All right. Well, I look forward to that. So, uh, secondary question, I guess, follow-up question about working with uh, the Penny Arcade guys. You guys... Lone Shark, but you guys, Lone Shark, uh, you and the team of Sharks, are running this campaign. This is kind of a procedural question. Penny Arcade is not running the campaign, and I think it's probably inarguable that they have a larger audience if they chose to run a Kickstarter campaign than a publishing company does. How did you guys figure out who does that and how and why? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, We were presumed to be better at reaching an audience of game players than they were. Sure. Uh, in in delivering a game, uh, uh, delivering a message of a, a game that is coming out to game players than they were. I think that's arguable. I actually think you could imagine it another way. But I don't... Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe it's... Maybe it's uh, our games are pretty serious. Sure. Um, and big. And big. And, and big. And so um, I guess I guess the logic would be that uh, if Penny Arcade just said it was making a game and we said we were going to help them, that may not create as much confidence in the game playing community. Whereas if we put out a Kickstarter campaign and say, we're going to make a game and, oh, by the way, the geniuses of Penny Arcade are going to provide game design, but also art and story, that just increases our reputation. That's right? true. Right? That's true. We, we, our game is presumed to be pretty good to start, and then we bring in these creative monsters, right? right? Uh, so I don't, think, I don't think anybody ever expects our games to look bad, but... 
when I, when we come in and, and say, this one's going to look amazing, they, they no one even blinks. Um, so, that makes sense. So I'm not sure there's a right answer to it. I, we certainly talked about them running it. Um, I don't know. I guess it, I guess, I guess we can uh, only find out by um, uh, switching to the DC Comics universe and checking out Earth 2, right. which is identical except Penny Arcade and this Kickstarter. Yeah, which that's a really strange thing to be the only difference between what? Earth and Earth 2. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you can't expect you can't expect a lot of difference. Right, right. I mean, but, obviously, right. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I mean, so it could be like uh, this is the same uh, we're, we're in Earth, and there's an Earth 2, but no one has invented the color mauve. That's fair. Wait, did I, you say mauve? Mauve, yeah. Well, mauve was invented. Do you know this story? No, no, I'm sorry. Are you, are you, saying, are you saying mauve? Yeah, mauve. Mauve? Mauve? Oh, wow. That's fascinating. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm from, I'm from the South, so that's fine. Well, continue, maybe continue. Maybe I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> I've always pronounced it mauve. Who could know? Maybe people like you so much that they didn't want to correct you. That's, or maybe, I, maybe I'm no, wrong, which seems I, more likely I, given available evidence. No, who knows? Who knows? Well, we live in a world where both, both, uh, both, where people can be united even in their differences over. <laughs> so, um, needless to say, Mike Krahulik has got an opinion. Right, because oh, he's yeah. got <laughs> he's got nineteen colors of mauve in his color palette that he's he's choosing between at the moment, right? Yeah. Uh, and he's it's just funny. like, it's not like it's mauve. Fuck's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, so um, yeah, I don't I don't know. Go back, going back to your question, I, I I don't know if there's a right way to do anything on Kickstarter. I mean. We, I, think, I think you're probably completely correct about that. Yeah, I think we, the right way to do it is the way that you do it and succeed. We do we do crazy stuff. Like who puts puzzles in a campaign? Right. I, I, I accepted it. I was scrolling like, all right, where's the riddle? Like where, yeah, where's exactly. my puzzle who, I get to do? Who, who decides that um, the right thing to do is to uh, make picture to make pe make people take pictures of their hands with string on them? Yeah. You know, this is a, whatever. But I'll tell you though. I'll tell you though. I'm gonna. I'm going to pay you a compliment, you and your entire team a compliment, um, but it might take me a second. Um, so I've known you for about three years now. Um, yes, absolutely. And I've known Elisa and Bo for about the same amount of time Yeah. Uh, since Gen Con from three years ago. And if I know anything about you and the people you work with, it's that all of you are dedicated not just to the craft of design, but dedicated to the craft of, craft of generating and sharing experiences with people. And it seems to me that if I know anything about the Lone Shark brand, it's that it isn't necessarily that the game is always about, that the game is the only way to deliver the experience. The Kickstarter campaign is a way to deliver the experience. The emails that you write are a way to deliver an experience. The packaging that you create, the components that you use, all of it wraps together to create an experience that you want people to have when they interact with your product. And to me, that wraps into the general ball, which is like, what is the Lone Shark brand? And how do you create products that get people excited and feel something? And it seems to me that you and your team are not alone, but certainly at the top of the mountaintop that holds a very small number of people who tr truly buy into this sense that you're trying to create a full experience from start to finish. And that I don't think that cutting corners even enters your mind. As a consumer, it doesn't seem to me... No. It's not like you're looking... It's like like you were just saying, you're looking to continue to climb that mountaintop to where you've created the perfect experience as a reflection in your mind. And yeah. that's the kind of thing that gets me excited as a consumer. Like, I'm going to buy Thornwatch even if I don't know that I would have fun playing it because I'm going to have fun with so many other things in it. And if I look back and say, wow, was it worth like $78 plus shipping or whatever for this? I'm going to say, yeah, of course it was. I got all these riddles and communication was amazing and these people make great stuff and I want to support that. And then the game came and look how beautiful it is, like how good the pieces feel, look at this art, look at this innovation. As a designer, look at all these new things that I've never even thought of that I now get to go sit and just like pick through and figure out how they made me feel and why, right? Yeah. Um, I, all of that's true. I, yeah, I mean, obviously we we put gameplay first and especially game testing and sure. development first, right? But if, if it were like... I've never been the kind of person to design a game and then try to figure out what the hell it is later, right? Um, 
And so uh, we, we definitely approach it holistically. And that's why our team looks really different than most other teams, right? I mean, we, um, we, we uh, you know, our CEO, Marie, uh, has a different take on how we, we function with our, with our suppliers and with our audience. Um, uh, we, we have a design team that's filled with people who can think visually uh, Liz Spain and and Elisa Teague, for example, are both both have uh, fashion design degrees. Yeah, right. That's not common amongst board game designers. Boy, but I bet the user experience and user interface of your games are better because of it. Yeah, and and obviously that extends to who we work with. I mean, so putting putting Mike Rahulik in a room and saying, "I need this to be visually both visually arresting and." have perfect information flow and he says I can do that because yep. he's read the same graphic design books I have right and so we just have a great mindset and then I mean you look at um, uh, our, our uh, operations side we uh, we we do our play tests live uh, with large groups of people and and they're always Full with folks. I mean, we're much more interested. Yes, we go to conventions to sell things, of course, but but we're really using that resources as feedback loop. And so our our games have print and plays that we're we're not afraid to give that out to people. We don't hide that stuff. Um, and obviously, we hide all sorts of bonus content in everything we do. Right. right. So there's always something below the surface. And especially in Apocrypha, which is entirely made out of below the surface. It's exciting to know that in a hobby that is, I mean, by all accounts, a luxury hobby, like these are luxury products we purchase, right, with expendable dollars, that there are companies and people who are willing to commit themselves to making those of the most value possible, right? It's like, you know, like if I'm going to go buy a lunch truck game, I expect it to be like I'm going to go drive like an Audi, right? It's going to be, this is going to be great. Every That's part of really this is going to nice be great. Compliment. Um, yeah. when I come, let's be clear where I come from. I come from Wizards of the Coast. I mean, sure. the lifestyle brand uh, around... Home of such notable games as Xena, the collectible card game. <laughs> yeah, I like that game. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have every deck. I have every deck ever made. On, on as do the I. Um, but no, I mean, what, sure, there's some throwaways along the way, but but <laughs> Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, and Pokemon, just to name three, pretty, pretty three good. games that have a pretty solid lifestyle brand in them. And yeah. I learned a few things along the way as to how valuable that can be. But, I, but we're not the only people. Like, I mean, if we take, away, take away Wizards of the Coast um, just for the moment because obviously they're in a class by themselves. But, but Paizo is a lifestyle brand company. Um, yeah. You know, uh, uh, and uh, Greater Than Games is a lifestyle brand company, you know, uh, and um, Monty Cook Games is a lifestyle brand company. Like, all these, all these people understand how valuable it is to have people who just feel like what you're creating is more than the game. And we, those are the people we... And those are the people we work with, right? So, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, it doesn't mean that everybody has to do it. It just means that we... We are willing to pay for that. Like right. We are willing to put money behind making the best possible experience for people so that they then think, I think I'm going to pull that game that had the riddles about it off the shelf. How much? So that's, that's a really good point. Um, if there's anything that I can say about Kickstarter games, it's that games from Kickstarter have a defining characteristic that I play them once and then never think of them again. Once, or even to back them and then never think of them again. Yeah except for the ones that are truly great, like Scythe back here on top of my wall, or Millennium Blades right below it, or Arcadia Quest right next to well, it, your wall, Quest right below it. Your wall is actually surviving having Scythe put on it? Uh, well, I had to reinforce the thing. Uh, I had, you know, for like six months, I had a little placard up there that said, coming soon, Scythe, like with a space. <laughs> <myself>. Wow. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I mean, obviously, uh, Jamie ran a very different kind of Kickstarter campaign there too, right? And so, yeah, um, yeah a lot of it is about your connection. But um, I, I, I think people should back whatever games they want, but... Um, I, I like it when people back our games thinking they're going to play them a lot. <laughs> that's that's what I mean, right? Like, 
you guys are creating games that I expect that I will play quite a bit. You're you're surpassing the threshold, which is like in a in a in an environment where I mean, I, correct me if I'm wrong. I imagine even you guys who've been around doing this for a couple of decades, like the degree to which games are released, the pace at which games are released is insane right now. Yeah. Like if I wanted to, I could play ten new games every week and I would not run out. Yeah. If you right? did a game, if you did a game review show, that yeah. was specifically. I want to play all the games that hit shelves or Kickstarter backers this week. Yeah. There's a decent chance you could you could fill 10 slots in yeah. that show. Really. For sure. I mean, I'm doing a podcast where I talk about what games I play every week. Yeah. And specifically prioritizing games that I haven't played before. And I still am, like, no not... Chance surface right i'm getting like two or three a week and i'm like oh well two or three of 50 that i could have done and did not right yeah absolutely um it is very well the kickstarter has um the reason the tabletop games category is the biggest category on kickstarter is that um while making games for an inexpensive amount relative to their quality is very hard making games is not hard sure right just simply getting on the phone or, or going to GameCrafter or some other way uh, with a printer or something and just saying, okay, I need a game and it needs uh, a board and it needs some cards and it needs some, some six-sided dice. Can you do that? The answer is that printer can do that. Yeah, the barrier to entry is remarkably low. Yeah, and so there will always be. So there's going to be two things that really matter in that. The first is can you actually deliver the game for the amount of money that you took in? Uh, which has turned out to be a bad thing for a lot of people. Right? <laughs> uh, but the second thing is, how good is your game? Because it's a real meritocracy. Even my stuff, like I've been doing this for a while. I'm relatively known, well, well known uh, amongst game designers. Sure. Uh, you know, for game designers, I should say. And my games don't get a pass. No one ever says, well, um, I'm just going to... Uh, play the the Mike Selinker game that I that I got even though I don't really like it. That's not a think, thing. Yeah, I don't think people say that. Is there anybody that people do say that for? Like, that's not a thing. No, that's yeah. not. A, whereas uh, in your television viewing, right, if a show goes through its, you know, goes through a slump or something like that, you stay with the show right. because you like the creator and hopefully they'll figure out what the hell they're doing. Well, and we're all completionists, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it just doesn't happen with the exception of games that uh, have a all the cards can dump into all the cards environment, right? Like there's some yeah. things where, like if you fell out of Magic the Gathering for five years, you would have you'd have a ramp up to get back. Yeah, tell me. I've done it twice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but I mean, even though, even then it wouldn't be that hard, right? Um, if you don't like uh, if you don't like a particular set from Magic, you can skip it. Right. Um, and so that's why it's a meritocracy. It's like we we don't get no people. People will give us a chance because of who we are, because we have people like Paul Peterson and Rodney Thompson and Elisa Teague on our our team. That they'll go. Well, the Lord's Waterdeep was really good. What's this Thornwatch? Yeah. Totally reasonable, but the that the bloom on that rose is ten minutes. Yeah, you gotta like yeah because it. it gets them to open the box and sit down and try it, but yeah. there's no there's nothing after that. Yeah, the, so it better be good. And right. so um, yeah, I I um, I buy a well. We have a thing called the Lone Shark Games Kickstarter Fund, so I end up with a lot of games. Uh, yeah, <laughs> people I know make, but um. I can't say I've played all of them. Right. But you can't. Like, you can't. I, I didn't really understand until I started trying to make games. You cannot make good games and also play games at the pace at which it's required to stay current. You just can't. Oh, yeah. I no, I would never. Even There are two reasons, obviously, for this, but I would never try to run a show that was about what's going on in the game industry. Right. Because I just don't know anymore, right? I mean, I used to be the person you went to to ask the question, uh, tell me about the new games that are coming out. And now I, I just don't. I <laughs> we'll talk about Dominion and Smash Up. Those are new, right? I've heard of those. Those yeah. are games I'm aware of. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, no. Uh, 
um, you what you want is you want to go to Board Game Geek Con and see what right. people are playing, right? What you want is to I find a new new site every week that tells me what the, the hot new games on Kickstarter are, you know, and so I uh, but in there is like you can't view this as a terrible thing. You, you, what it, you can view it as as a competitive thing, right? right. The, there's there's like okay, there's going to be only so many dollars in the marketplace, but but um, you can't view an explosion of creativity as bad. No, of course not. It's great, right? Because the more products exist, the more normalized it is for people to spend money on these products, which is great for all of us, right? And it also uh, has the effect of making people more well-rounded consumers. Um, they sure. might buy a thing that they wouldn't otherwise buy. Uh, so if a person who's only a role-playing game player um, sees that uh, we're making a Numenera-based game, might be the only card game they ever buy. Right, or it might get them to try two or three other card games. Yeah, they, might, they, like they might see that, they might play it, and they realize Paul Peterson's a pretty good game designer. What's this smash-up thing? Gotta go play some guillotine! That's right, well, you best go play some guillotine. <laughs> um, so good. Also so, sitting on a shelf within arm's reach of me. Oh, yeah, no, that, that one is not in the category of doesn't get pulled off the shelf. That one is yeah. a perennial, uh, oh, we're going on a... We're going on a trip, and and we're not taking another Pathfinder set with us, right? Because <laughs> because that's the whole car, kids. Um, no, you pull guillotine down, right? I was on a yep. show yesterday or two days ago with Mike Fitzgerald, and um, oh, you did Ludology, didn't you? Yeah, yeah I did. Yeah. That is not yet, but it's going to be great. And uh, so, uh, you know, Mystery Rummy is another example of one of those games that just you know. This isn't gonna last forever. Yep. It doesn't really matter. Do you want to play a game? How about Mystery Rummy? Sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, Smash Up is like that and such. So uh, I hope we make a few of those, and uh, and I hope that the ones we put out, we really stick our necks out on, like Thornwatch. Get in. Yeah. I mean, speaking of games, you guys might put out, and that might be awesome. Betrayal of House on the Hill, Widow's Walk releases in almost exactly a month, right? Um, yeah, uh, I think it's even sooner than that. I think it's like, uh, I have October 21st in my head, but I can't find it. Yeah, uh, I think there's, it might be October. I don't remember. I think it's October 14th, but I'm not hundred percent sure. So please don't hold me to that. Um, the, um, I have a very interesting month next month. Um, I have, I have three very different horror games coming out at the same time. And, uh, uh, I have uh, Pathfinder set Mummy's Mask. I have the new version of Unspeakable Words, and the first expansion ever for Betrayal at House on the Hill. Right, so it's going to be an interesting month. Those could all come out within like a week of each other. Is it is it a little dubious to call Unspeakable Words a horror game? Well, <laughs> okay, <laughs> probably. Um, a game it's like, it's like, with, like three sets of horror art that are releasing. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, is, is it reasonable to call any game by John Kavalik a horror, illustrated by John Kavalik a horror game? Also a fair point. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, they're going to they're gonna reach very different audiences, so I'm not too worried. Uh, but yes, you asked about Betrayal at House on the Hill, Widow's Walk. Um, it's going to be great, I hope, Yes. Uh, well, I think you um, are familiar with some of the content in it. Uh, I'm familiar with exactly one haunt of content in that game. So, um, uh, yes, it's going to be amazing. Um, it's going to be very different than the main Betrayal box because the main Betrayal box was... Um, well, it started with Bruce Glasgow, who was the original designer, and then Rob Davio and I got involved, and I brought in a small but powerful team of people to work on it. Uh, Bruce Cordell, Taylor Woodruff, um, Bill Slavisak, a number of other people, Brian Tinsman, right? Um, uh, and it was great. Um, More than great. My favorite yeah. game ever. So Well, fantastic. I'm very much yeah. happy about that. This team is a little bigger. <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> this team is a little more diverse. Um, I said so. I said for years that I wasn't going to do any expansions to Betrayal at House on the Hill because um, they're really hard to make, and 
it was the past and that's wizards and whatever but also you have like fairly high standards for content creation as you talked about previously yeah. like you're not going to do two haunts and put them out there you're going to do 50 yeah. right there's no, there's no scenario where i put out five haunts for betrayal of house on the hill and say i may do an expansion right exactly not a thing so um when uh when conversation got serious about this, um, when they approached me on it, and for the first time I didn't just sort of reject the possibility out of hand in my head, um, uh, I realized that I had a very unique opportunity, which was to use the all the people who over the years had told me that um, they were big fans of the game. I was like, well, then write a thing for it. And so, uh, you know, people like uh, Pendleton Ward, who did Adventure Time, and and Max and Eli from Cards Against Humanity, and uh, Anita Sarkeesian, and Zoe Quinn, and and uh, Mikey Newman from Borderlands, and John Gilmore, who did Dead of Winter, and all these people, right, who just over the years said, this is one of the great games. I'm so glad you, you brought it into our lives. And, and very notably... Liz Spain and Elisa Teague, who uh, became the co-designers with me on this, um, because that's their game. That's the game that got Elisa Teague, uh, that Elisa plays every week. That's the game that um, Liz was in her first uh, hobby game ever, right? And a lot of people, for some reason, it fits that description. I'm not really clear. My, my second one, yeah. Yeah, I'm not really clear how that happened. That's a very unique thing to me. I it seems to be so many people's revelation that the hobby game industry exists. I, I can tell you exactly why that happens because I, I run two or three events every month where we have new gamers introduced to the hobby. It is because if I have six people of whom four are regular gamers and two are new attendees to an event and I want them to play something with me, I can pull out Betrayal and say, hey, it's cool. You'll figure it out as you go check out this amazing game. It's such an inclusive experience. Yeah, it's really hard. It's, it's very hard for anybody to, since turns are short and it's really obvious what you can do on a turn, mm -hmm. uh, you're never going to get overrun by somebody who just tells you, trust me, I know how this game should be played. Just do what I tell you. This never happens. Right. So, um, but, um, but yeah, uh, so I just realized I had this great opportunity to make these people work for me on this subject and they, they all came in and they created the most demented content of all like truly like I, I there are people who are probably listening to this going sure sure I'm sure it'll be all all great you know whatever but but whatever no I literally mean some of it is flat out demented um, I look forward to the 20 years of my life it will require to randomly get into every one of those haunts. Oh, well, that is a thing. Um, I hope that people have figured out ways to uh, ways to short circuit that process. Sure. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's the other big thing about the expansion, right? Since there hasn't been any new content for 12 years, you're very clear. Like when you pop a haunt out, uh, you know exactly what's going to happen now, right? Yeah. And, and, and that's not going to be the case for the first time ever. It's right? really exciting. You're going to open the thing and you're just going to go, I don't know what the other player is reading. Right. Because I've never seen it. I don't know what they're going to do at all. And I think that that changes your experience with the game. So um, I'm very happy with it. I'm just really happy that I got so many cool people to help out and, and now they feel they're a part of something they really love. And... Uh, it really is a love letter from the fans of Betrayal to the fans of Betrayal. And um, I've already gotten the, okay, so when's the next one coming out? Like, look, it took me 12 years. I will just erase that question from my yeah. list here. Do yeah, exactly. I appreciate that. But it took me a little while to get this one done. I cannot guarantee you we'll be doing it again anytime soon. Sure. Uh, um, well, I am ex I'm very excited for it. It's probably my number one expansion of the year. Even though I haven't played it yet, it has to be. I mean, it's certainly a lot of people are telling me that. Um, I hope it, I, I would like to think it lives up to that, that expertise. Right. Well, awesome. All right. Uh, we are running up against one o'clock, man, which means that you've been on here for an hour. And uh, oh I'm sure you have important Thornwatch things to do, uh, as well as all the other projects you're working on. Yeah, I mean, my, my pro most of my day actually isn't Thornwatch. My day is mostly just 
the last stages of getting Apocrypha done. Um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, the thing, the thing that I, um, I spend, like I'm, I'm really spending my time on these days is writing a lot of flavor text for a very flavor rich game. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's always a good time to take time out and talk about brainy stuff with you. Well, I appreciate the time, man, as always. I think this is the fifth or sixth time you've been on. It's always fantastic. My very wow. favorite interviews are always here. Cool, cool. All right, guys, uh, go check out Thornwatch on the Kickstarter page. It's available you know, through Kickstarter. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can click the link in the doobly-doo just below. If you're watching embedded through Facebook or Twitter or BGG, you can, of course, just Google Thornwatch Kickstarter and you will find it. You have six days left to uh, solve all the riddles, get all the crests, do all the things. Oh, hello, puppy. Hi. My brush just jumped over here. Oh. oh, man. Dog alert. That's the best. Sorry. Sorry sorry to Kickstarter viewers who are allergic to dogs. <laughs> uh, the show is a, we have a long and storied appreciation of dogs on the show. It's totally okay. fine. I love the thought that somebody could be allergic to dogs through the internet. Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm just saying, like, there's some hypoallergenic nonsense there happening. Um, so, yeah, guys, go check out Thornwatch. Uh, learn all you can about it. You've got a few days left to back it. And uh, thank you for watching, Mike. Thank you, of course, for being here. And uh, we will see everybody the next time. Oh, also, happy birthday to my dad, who's, whose birthday it is today on happy, September 29th. So. Happy birthday, Dad. It was yeah. my dad's birthday uh, uh, about uh, eight days ago, and it was my birthday two days ago. So, happy birthday. Oh, oh well, happy. Happy birthday to everyone. Yay. Happy birthday, everyone. Someday my dad will watch this, maybe, and he'll be like, wow, that one guy said happy birthday. <laughs> so I have no idea who he was. It was that yeah. guy with the dog. I started Perfect. teasing immediately. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mike. We'll catch you guys in the next episode of Back It. Bye, everyone. Bye.